Shop smart, shop S smart. Let's go. It's my stinky little earth dwellers. Look at my army of darkness shirt. It's a 2008 edition, so not an original from 1993, but still very rare and I'm obsessed. I'm not gonna ramble on in my intro as usual because today's video will be long enough as it is, so let's jump right in. Today we're doing a deep dive of the Evil Dead franchise, starting with the backstory of the three dudes. I don't know if they have a nickname in the fandom, but I'm talking about Sam Raimi, Bruce Campbell, and Robert Tapper. That will flow into the inception of the short film Into the Woods, and then that'll lead us right into the the first Evil Dead. Now I have already done an original versus remake comparison on the original Evil Dead and the 2013 film. That was about a year ago and it contains a lot of really good behind the scenes information. Consider this video kind of a companion piece to that one and don't be surprised if I leave out major behind the scenes stuff because I've likely already covered it and in fact if you want to watch all of my past Evil Dead content first then I have made a playlist. It's readily available for you to check out on my channel. Then I'll basically go through the timeline of the entire franchise so I will talk about every film in order, but that will be broken up by different video game eras as well as talking about the TV show. Don't expect too much information on the video games. My sole focus today really is going to be on the films, but I still will give you a synopsis on each game, some fun facts if I find them, stuff like that. Trust me, there is more than enough to get into with just the films alone. We'll be talking box office, cultural impact, behind the scenes horror stories, and so much more. I'll conclude by covering a bunch of bits and bobs that don't really warrant their own chapter. This will also include the legacy, the conventions, the fans. If you're psyched to get into that and I have you sold, then maybe you should consider joining the cult of Haunted Hippie. We are the largest horror fan cult to ever exist, led by yours truly, the Antichrist, your unholy ruler. Yes, I will swallow your soul. <laughs> But in return, you get hours and hours of bingeable free content from me. I promise I treat every soul with care. It's safe with me. So can I have it? Can I have your soul, please? Though I'm more of a soul slurper than a soul swallower. I like to give it the old <laughs> And then I just, I keep it right here in my heart. See, perfectly safe. All you have to do is click subscribe. It also helps to click the like button and the notification bell so you never miss our next meeting. Okay, another thing to note before we get into it, there will probably be spoilers for pretty much every film. I'm not doing intensive plot breakdowns the way that I did for Scream, but important plot points will be relevant to the discussion nonetheless. One last disclaimer before we get into everything, I'm not sure that this video is for the mega super fans of the franchise. I myself am just now falling down the rabbit hole, having not really been a fan previously myself. When I saw Evil Dead Rise in theaters twice, that all changed. So you could probably consider this Evil Dead for dummies, but I promise it is still juicy. I dug up as many archival interviews and fun behind the scenes clips as I could during my research, and so I have a lot of fun stuff to share. Now that we have all the disclaimers out of the way, now that you have joined the cult and sacrificed your soul to me, we can jump right in. So that it was your intention from the beginning to make a brutal, savage <laughs> horror film? Uh, yes. No, not to make a brutal, savage horror film. We wanted to make a film that would definitely uh, entertain the horror crowd. Let's pick up with our boys in 1978. Bruce Campbell and Sam Raimi had both dropped out of school in order to pursue filmmaking, and Robert Tappert was a few years older and he was finishing up his degree in economics. Tappert and Raimi were studying at Michigan State University, and Tappert was basically the catalyst for all their filmmaking careers. They made a lot of Super 8 films in high school, and it seems like they were always destined to be filmmakers. However, before jumping right into it, they made some calculated moves to re research the industry they wanted to be a part of. Sam and I first decided to do a horror film after doing research on, on what pictures did well in the markets. And at the time, which was the late 70s, there were still a lot of drive-ins, especially in the Midwest where we grew up. And there were forever horror films playing in the drive-ins on double bills and that, which we always saw and said, God, we can make something better than this. We, there's absolutely no doubt about it. It's reminiscent of myself, to be honest. Doing all this research on classic films and current trends, trying to enter the industry where I can. But much like many other very famous horror directors, for them, horror was not the ambition. It was just the springboard. At that time, especially to be a filmmaker, you 
had to start out by either making a horror movie or making an adult film. While Raimi's main interest was comedy, specifically with the Three Stooges, they know that that wouldn't be where they would get their start. So like I said, Raimi ended up dropping out of school and he got a basic job to start saving up money. This was to hire a lawyer who would work out the rights with his future investors. That was one part of the plan. The other part of the plan was making a short film called Within the Woods. This was a short film they shot in three days, which was basically a proof of concept for the Evil Dead. They had a budget of roughly $1,600 and used this to pitch to their investors. It's 29 minutes long and it's actually free to watch on YouTube, so I will include it in my research master post linked down below. There are some moments where the audio cuts out. Don't worry, it's not your device. That just happens to old movies sometimes. I think we're lucky that it still exists at all and it's free to watch on YouTube. I think you'll also get a kick out of why Bruce Campbell was always the face of their films. Bruce Campbell starred in every Super 8 movie that we made because very simply he was the good looking one and still is. So he said, hmm, the girls like you, we'll put you in front of the camera. The girls don't like us, we'll stay behind the camera. Only when Bruce was unavailable would we put ourselves in front of the camera. One of the key differences between The Evil Dead and this short film is that in the short film, they were having a picnic over an Indian burial ground. Though he still made women run through the woods and had some pretty gnarly, bloody makeup, I recommend skimming through it, maybe not necessarily watching it in its entirety, but you can feel the storyteller's spirit flowing through this short. That's what was shown to the potential investors, and that's an interesting tangent all on its own. What's unique about this classic film is that unlike Friday the 13th or Halloween, it was not financed by actual film producers. Producers. Yes, many classics were also independent, but maybe you'd be surprised to learn that The Evil Dead was funded by dentists, realtors, basically anyone with money who would listen. When we went to people knocking on doors and showing them a, a short version of the film we intended to make for money, they were still struck by the novelty of the thing, not having lived in a film production town. It could have been a great advantage the fact that we were asking for this money in a place that they don't make films. I think that living in Detroit had a lot to do with it. At that time, making movies was very much a Western thing, so I see how they spun that to their advantage. And look at them now. Imagine being one of the dentists that funded the first Sam Raimi feature, and now he's one of the most famous directors in the world. Largely due to his start with The Evil Dead. It's a love story. Uh... No, it's not a love story, but Evil Dead is a film about five college students that go up to this small cabin in the mountains of Tennessee. And there they find an ancient book and a tape recording of a man, both left there by this man, a professor, who had gone to this cabin to study these artifacts on this dig. And he unleashes these evil forces. And in fact, they're still there as these children are one by one terrorized by it. Now I'm not going to go over all of the horror stories from that set because I do detail a lot of them in my original verse remake comparison video. I've also already talked about how they found the cabin, how they had to shovel mysterious poop out of it, and how they basically had to completely remodel it just to make it usable for the film. But there was also theft, there was sleeping on the hardwood floors to prevent the theft, there were bruises, infections, painful colored lenses, basically you name it, it happened. Seriously, go watch that other video just to get a scope of all of the injuries these actors faced. However, if you ask Sam Raimi what the most difficult part of filming was, he would probably talk about the money. The most difficult thing about making the film was when we'd reach stretches where we would run out of money and having to stop for three months whatever we're doing and become put on our suits again and get our briefcases out, our matching briefcases, and cut our hair short and shave, look presentable again and go on, around knocking on doors asking for more money. So not only are they shooting under some of the worst conditions imaginable, but they have to keep stopping and starting. I imagine it wasn't the easiest easiest thing to keep convincing the crew to come back time and time again because they were essentially agreeing to be tortured again. Especially Ellen Sandwise, who had to shoot probably one of the most infamous nature scenes in all of cinema. You know the one, you don't need the details. To my delight, it seems that Sam Raimi has always regretted shooting that. Despite its popularity, the film has one scene that some people found offensive. As a result, the film was almost banned from release on video. Regret putting it in? I do. Well, I think it was unnecessarily gratuitous and a little too brutal. And I th finally, because people were offended in a way that I, I, my goal is not to offend people. It is to entertain, thrill, scare, make them laugh, but not to offend them. I think I, my, my judgment was a little wrong at that time. One last tidbit that I found really funny is how they basically trashed everything that they rented. Some equipment got stolen entirely, and they also basically destroyed a truck that they rented. So we shot for 12 weeks and basically damaged uh, mentally and 
or otherwise, every crew member, every cast member, every piece of equipment we ever rented. Uh, we ruined cameras, camera cables. When we got back to Detroit, they said, you are not renting from us anymore, any more equipment. We destroyed a white pickup truck during the course of the shoot, the one that I would ride in, in the back of covered with blood because they wouldn't let me sit in the front seat. I want to focus on that bit about the truck. They were shooting this movie in the back country of Morristown, Tennessee. A very conservative location to be shooting. I'm sure that it was chock full of God-fearing country folk. That's who would look on as they paraded Bruce Campbell's blood-soaked body through the town. He'd be covered in blood every day. They weren't going to let him sit in the cab. So he sat in the back, just scaring all the children. Again, I must urge you to check out my other video to fill in all the gaps of all the horror stories on that set. Because hearing all of that, it's a wonder that this movie ever got finished. Because you always hear that frustrating advice of like, don't wait. If you want to be a filmmaker, make a movie. And it's like, yeah, that's great, but I have no money. I don't have any equipment, so thanks for that. But then you take the three dudes who saved up a bunch of money just to buy suits so that they would look professional going into these people's homes, and they really conjured up that money from thin air, like from dentists and realtors. And they had to keep going back and asking for more money and stopping production, but they were nothing if not determined. So definitely an inspiration, I think, for younger filmmakers. Just do it. A wonder that it ever got finished, but it did. And then came time for distribution. They did have a big premiere initially, which was detailed in Bruce Campbell's memoir, If Chins Could Kill, Confessions of a B-Movie Actor, which I'm desperate to get my hands on now, by the way. He talked about how they were inspired by William Castle. He was a popular horror director in the 50s and 60s who kind of relied on gimmicks to market his movies. So they set up ambulances outside the premiere to kind of get people hyped up and get them scared walking into the movie. Audiences responded very enthusiastically, which encouraged them to seek out proper distribution by basically touring the movie. They then met a man named Irvin Shapiro, who helped them change the movie's name to The Evil Dead. It was initially called The Book of the Dead. Anyway, he was one of the founders of a little shindig called the Cannes Film Festival, and he got the movie screened there in 1982. And who should be there to promote Creepshow? Well, none other than Stephen King. The three dudes credit Stephen King, actually, for Evil Dead becoming what it became. Stephen King made Evil Dead in a way because he did that interview in Twilight Zone magazine. He loved it so much, you know, he did that glowing piece about it. According to Raimi, none of the U.S. distributors were very interested, but finally Paris Pictures picked it up and they started showing it in the U.K. It became an absolute hit over there and then finally the U.S. caught wind of it. Now if you want to hear why Sam Raimi faced an obscenity charge over in the U.K. because of this film, then again check out my original verse remake video. But this movie has been through censorship hell, even landing itself on the video nasty list, which I do hope to cover someday. But aside from that, the response was very positive and this led to its commercial release thanks to New Line Cinema. This the movie first only opened in 15 theaters, but made over $100,000 and became what's known as a sleeper hit, eventually grossing $2.4 million domestically. Including its international release, it probably made close to $30 million overall. Surprisingly, now we already have to chat about the first video game of the franchise called The Evil Dead, released in 1984. It was made to be played on the Commodore 64, the BBC Micro, and ZX Spectrum. The game is set in the cabin from the Evil Dead film. The player controls Ash and must close cabin windows to prevent monsters from entering while also killing monsters that are already in the cabin. As the player defeats monsters with various weapons, shovels, shotguns, and axes, Ash's energy level decreases. He must continuously pick up new weapons in order to increase his energy. Once he has defeated all the monsters, Ash must obtain the Book of the Dead and destroy it in order to defeat the evil. Your Computer Magazine reviewed the game with concerns, saying that it might spawn computer nasties in the same vein as the video nasties. But those concerns were quickly put to rest because, as you saw, once people began playing, the game, they realized there was not even any gore to be found, but they wouldn't release another video game for the next 16 years, so on to the next film. I wrote a sequel. I've got the outline for it, but whether it's ever made into a movie would depend on the, whether Evil Dead makes money. It should be a lot of fun, this sequel. It's got a lot more, more stuff in it, and uh, it moves in a different direction than Evil Dead, but it should be just as entertaining and funny, I hope. Before I get into Evil Dead 2, though, we have to talk about a little-known movie called Crime Wave. Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell teamed up again to make this comedy film, trying to ride off of the success of Evil Dead. Raimi actually co-wrote this movie with the Coen brothers, and it was released in 1985. Fed up of his business partner, Ernest Trend hires the services of two exterminators. When things go drastically wrong and they murder the wrong man, and the race is on to frame an innocent video surveillance man. This project was pretty much a net failure. First of all, it did not 
help further establish them as director and actor, and it was also miserable on set. In fact, Box Office Mojo reports that it only made about $5,000 in theaters, despite costing $3 million to make. Apparently, as horrible as they were, the dudes preferred the conditions of working on Evil Dead to that of Crime Wave. There was obviously no investor involvement on Evil Dead. A realtor is not going to come to set and go, oh, are you sure that you're using the right lens? But when they were making a studio film, apparently there was constant involvement, there was no creative freedom, and so they were clashing constantly. So after that unfortunate failure, the next step was naturally Evil Dead 2. Now, yet again, Stephen King was instrumental in propping up their careers. And there was a crew member that we were, we had hired briefly to work on some production aspects, but we had to let her go. We were like, okay, well, we don't think we're going to get this sequel made. She goes off to North Carolina to work on Maximum Overdrive, directed by Stephen King. They start talking on the set. He goes, what are you, what are you up to? Oh, I just was working with these guys. They're trying to get Evil Dead 2 made, but they can't get the money. Stephen King goes to Dino De Laurentiis. You should finance Evil Dead 2. <laughs> Dino De Laurentiis, he smacks his hands together. Whenever a deal was done, he would go like this. <laughs> basically, after that, the deal was basically done. Dino financed it because Stephen King told him he should finance it. So voila, now they have three and a half million dollars to make Evil Dead 2 and a whole lot more experience under their belts. And thus, Evil Dead 2 went underway. <laughs> Mark Shostrom led the special effects and animation team that is responsible for all of the effects in Evil Dead 2, and a notable member of his team is Greg Nicotero, who of course you probably know from The Walking Dead, but he is a legend in the effects department. They had 12 weeks of prep time because there were 105 makeup and effects shots in total, and so they ended up being on the project for six months. Because the project was so long and intensive, they lived in Wadesboro, North Carolina in a house together for the duration of the shoot. And here comes our first horror story right off the bat, but I think it helps to set the backdrop for this film. Not only is this town dead hot, they are shooting in the middle of summer, so they have to dip their sheets in ice water and have four fans blowing on them all at once just to sleep at night, but of course they're also here for three months, so they have to take their clothing to a laundromat. Well, they accidentally went into one that they thought was just in a low-income neighborhood, but when they realized the truth, it was much more horrific. A woman comes over to us and is like, you know, you boys shouldn't be here, this is the black, um, laundromat. No, the white laundromat's over there. Packed up our stuff and went to this beautiful laundromat, you know, that had air conditioning and video games and concession stands. I was like, wow, this place is really a trip, you know, and it's one of the things we found a lot of. Like, there was a restaurant and it was divided and there was segregation in this restaurant. And even at the movie theater, there's a white entrance and a black entrance. Very strange. This is 1986. Yet again, they're having to deal with rural America and how terrifying to know that you're in such a backwards and racist town. Luckily, the area they were filming in was fairly secluded, but it was no less hot. They were filming in a school gymnasium, and many of the actors had to be covered in prosthetics for days, if not weeks, on end. The two people that Sam Raimi delighted in torturing the most were Bruce Campbell and his own brother, Ted Raimi. We'll get into Bruce, but while we're still on the effects, let's get into what Ted Raimi suffered. One of his worst outfits of the franchise was his Henrietta suit, which, as you can see, was very thick. And the horror stories that came from this suit, oh my god. Apparently, he fainted at a few points of production, likely due to heat exhaustion. He lost pounds of water weight from sweating buckets every day. When they would take the suit off, sweat would pour out of it, and there's even a take that made the movie where sweat was dumping out of his ear hole. It's inexplicable. It's beyond your wildest nightmares. <laughs> I don't think that you or I could even conceptualize how hot it was in that suit. The closest that I've probably come is spending 12-hour days at volleyball camps. That was in the dead of summer, so I left sufficiently moist, but I never came close to that amount of sweat. Now, this next Next bit, I'm sorry to focus on his sweat for so long, but please just listen to this. Ted wore monster booties, and they would take his booties off, and they would pour his sweat into Dixie cups and save it up on a counter, a shelf, in the makeup effects. I mean, boy, that was a big day for Ted. It got up to like three quarters of a cup of the most rancid shit you've ever seen in your life. Sometimes Bruce Campbell likes to f*** around. I hope that he's kidding here, but I honestly wouldn't put it past the effects team. They were nuts, okay? They described living together like being in a frat. They were constantly messing around, whether it be something benign like goofily recreating the POV camera movements in their warehouse to driving donuts with their production car. Sam and Bruce were not that much different, and thanks to Greg Nicotero for shooting this behind-the-scenes stuff, we can see just how goofy they really were. Anytime I would have the camera on Bruce and, and, and Sam, or Bruce and yeah. Rob or somebody, they'd be talking, they'd just stop and go, hello. 
What we're prepared to do here is a very scary scene. As you know, we're about to shoot a very dangerous scene, Greg. By the Daisy Maisel, with the pleasure of Daisy Peasy, especially with the Daisy Lazy. You put your hands in the air and you'll jump on the blazing, there's a cross of heads of hands. It's sex with the Caesar on the blazing. These were just the most unserious people ever to be making movies. Except not really, because do you remember how I mentioned that Sam Raimi delighted in torturing his actors? Bruce Campbell experienced the brunt of this for the entire trilogy, but especially in Evil Dead 2 and Army of darkness. According to everyone on that set, and Bruce himself, Sam was just always giddy about torturing him. You know these movies, you know how many prosthetics and stunts that Bruce had to endure. But for the most part, he did it very happily. In fact, the only stunts that he wouldn't do himself are when Ash had to like fall down a flight of stairs or something. Yes, Sam told him to flip himself over and over and over, but he did so no questions asked. Another scene that was surprisingly taxing and lengthy to film was the flying branch scene. But it may all have been part of Sam Raimi's masochistic plan to torture Bruce. Because they would basically have all the crew members standing in a line and they were all holding branches and then they would whack Bruce with it and then get back in line. The shot where Bruce is being propelled through the trees on the Samo cam, which was called, where it rotated him around. Sam was the first one there with branches to smash Bruce with the branches, just to torment him. He, he had a slapstick side to him but he was very mischievous. They did that all day long. They took an entire set day to shoot those five seconds. Mind you that most set days run from 12 to 16 hours on average, and I'm sure that Evil Dead had plenty days much longer than that. So just all day long, probably like 14 hours of Bruce just getting hit in the face over and over while he's on this rig. Again, there's so much behind the scenes stuff to get into that I don't wanna go over everything, but just know that there were just as many, if not more on set injuries the second time around. So moving away from the torture, I'll leave off with something really fascinating. You know the famous eyeball scene that was paid homage in Evil Dead Rise? So it was actually shot in reverse. And there's some good BTS in the Swallowed Souls documentary where Sam Raimi also talks about how that was inspired by the Three Stooges. It wasn't just this bit though. A lot of our favorite sequences in the Evil Dead trilogy were shot in reverse, meaning that pretty much all the actors they cast had to be really good at backwards acting. The last thing that I'll say about the production of this film is that many people think that Ash was just stupid enough to go back to the cabin in the sequel. But that is a misconception because what they were actually doing is retconning the previous film. I know a lot of fans know that, but a surprising amount don't. The reason being though, is that this time they were being funded by a different company. They didn't have the rights to use the footage from the original Evil Dead, and so they didn't have a choice. So here is Bruce Campbell's explanation of the connection between one and two. So there's a big debate of is Evil Dead 2 a remake or a sequel? It's a requel, uh, you know, it's, it's whatever you wanna call it. So if you really wanna do it right, you take the first Evil Dead up to where the evil entity hits me, cut off all the recap, go right into Ash being thrown through the trees at the beginning, lands, play the movie. It would all make perfect sense. Did you hear that? Bruce Campbell used the term requel. Guy Busick and James Vanderbilt, Scream 5 writers, you have some explaining to do. You should have trademarked that, Bruce. Okay, I could go on all day about the behind the scenes of these movies, but we should probably move on. The first time I saw it, I think it was a real revelation because the way Sam Raimi used the camera was completely new. He took the camera and liberated it. I think that the it propelled the film language many decades into the future. Before the film could become a sensation though, they had to get it distributed, which yet again, just like the first movie, was a total hassle. They were contractually obligated to make an R-rated film, but the DEG was positive it was gonna get an X rating, which would hurt its commercial success. They worked around this though. Remember their investor and producer, De Laurentiis? Well, his son set up a shell company to handle distribution. Yes, Sam Raimi himself shot the logo you see at the beginning of the film as a workaround to the MPAA a ratings board. Do what you gotta do, you know? As far as the reception of this film, it performed well and received critical acclaim. Despite only opening in 310 theaters, it made over $800,000 in its opening weekend and over $5 million in its total worldwide run. It also received nominations for many prestigious awards like the Saturn Award for Best Horror Film, Best Makeup, and Best Effects. And I think you'll be interested to hear what hugely acclaimed modern directors took away from this film. I have more to share from Del Toro, but Tarantino was a huge fan as well. I remember I remember uh, discussing it with every young filmmaker in Mexico. We all loved it. I remember a great conversation I had with Jim Cameron, and Jim Cameron said that is one of the most important film language camera pitch uh, movies in the last 
15, 20 years. What's the point of ever shooting any movie not like that? I know. All right, that seemed like, okay, a new shooting style has been developed and everything else looks old-fashioned by comparison. Evil Dead 2 is also largely hailed as the best Evil Dead film of the franchise by the fan base. It's rated at a 4.1 on Letterboxd with over 300,000 reviews. I think that it's worth noting that that's the same average score as Scream. Though to be fair, Scream has 960,000 ratings, which is over three times as many as Evil Dead 2. I wonder where Evil Dead 2 would sit if it had that many reviews, but the fact remains that it has an insanely high score. Safe to say it will live on as a classic film. And now, the moment that I have all been waiting for, let's get into Army of Darkness. How happy do you feel with the finished product, Evil Dead 2? It's okay. I think it's okay. Uh, it was a fine picture to make when I was 26, and now that I'm 28, I want to make a picture that's probably about 10 times as good. I say it's the moment that I've been waiting for because, if you couldn't tell, it's my favorite movie of the franchise. I am repping my team today. Unfortunately, there is the least amount of coverage on this installment, but there's still a lot of fun stuff to get into. But again, before we get into Army of Darkness, we have to talk about a movie called Dark Man. Sam Raimi co-wrote and directed this superhero film for Universal Studios that also pays homage to all the classic Universal monsters. When thugs employed by a crime boss lead a vicious assault on Dr. Peyton Wilder, leaving him literally and psychologically scarred, an emergency procedure allows him to survive. Upon his recovery, Wilder can find solace only by returning to his scientific work developing synthetic skin and seeking revenge against the crime boss. That movie grossed almost $50 million worldwide, and due to that success, they greenlit Army of Darkness. This was exciting because now they had studio backing for the film they originally wanted to be Evil Dead 2. Army of Darkness was the original plan for an Evil Dead sequel, and it was going to be called The Medieval Dead. Can we just take a moment of silence on that one? The Medieval Dead is such a better name than Army of Darkness. I feel like the studio really screwed them on that. Now, the production of this film, despite that studio backing, was no less hellish. Let's keep talking about how Sam Raimi loved torturing Bruce Campbell and his brother Ted. It was probably, I would say, the most physically uncomfortable movie in the history of motion pictures. And any other actor can kiss my ass loud and hard. I think that Bruce Campbell knew what he was getting himself into, though, because interestingly, he and his wife made the conscious choice to get married before they started shooting this film. She was a costume designer. And they joke about it now because they're still married, but they both said it was probably a really bad idea to do that. They get married and then immediately put their marriage through the most intensive test possible by working on this set. Also, all the pictures of them on the red carpet together are hilarious. If this isn't the energy, then I don't want it. There's also a misconception that he and his wife met on the set of Army of Darkness, but they actually had met on a different set about a year prior. So not only is Campbell trying to navigate newlywed life, but he is still enduring an equal amount, if not more, torture. The guy drops you off, you, you go, you lie down, and then someone's knocking on your door, and it's the guy picking you up in the morning. You're like, no, 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 must be some mistake. I just put my head on the pillow, the pillow here. Anytime when Bruce is really getting hit, that's Sam doing it. And Sam loves to torture. Bruce. Like, he loves torturing him. So Bruce Campbell is trying to navigate married life. He is not getting any sleep, and Raimi continues to torment him any chance he gets. Oh, he had to ride a horse all the time, and he said it was a good thing he was wearing a cape because his ass was always clapping on the saddle because he didn't really know how to ride. He also got thrown from the horse one time, ouch. And he is spending hours and hours every day getting crazy prosthetics put on. So he's doing all of that and performing all the stunts, banging up his body, no sleep, covered in pounds of uncomfortable latex and glue. Last horror story with Bruce Campbell, even though there are many more of them. He also got a really nasty cut one day of filmmaking on his face. He had to go to the hospital to get stitched up, and they didn't know which one was real because he had all his makeup on. So from that point on, his real injury became part of his makeup. In recent panels that he's done for Evil Dead Rise, he says that he has no sympathy for any other actor because he knows that he has already made the most difficult film to make in history. It turns out that pretty much everyone was miserable on that set, though, because they were shooting this in the high desert of California during the summertime. This meant that it was bleeding hot during the day and it was freezing cold at night, just an absolute lose-lose. Marcus Gilbert even reported being so hot in his night costume that he lost 11 pounds in one day. All water weight from his sweat. It was like Ted 2.0. Ted Raimi really had no less difficulty on this set because he played no less than four live action roles. He's a worker in the store, he plays one of the knights, he was one of the peasants, if you will. Oh, and he did a bunch of voices for the skeletons. And speaking of the skeletons, 
scenes, the practical effects for this movie are incredible. Not only was Nicotero's team tasked with figuring out how to make these skeletons come to life, but they also had to take on a good deal of the costuming as well. Some of the skeletons ended up being animatronic, some of them were puppets, and some of them were suits that they made. They sculpted skull masks and bones and put that over top of essentially a black morph suit. They also built crazy rigs for the pterodactyl type creature, like it did some whole ass engineering to achieve the effects for this film. And it was a gymnast inside the actual suit so she could pull out some sick moves. Members of the effects team have also said that this was their favorite film they ever worked on in their career. And Greg Nicotero also sings very high praises of Sam. Sam was never shy about using puppets, about using makeups, about using miniatures. I mean, in Evil Dead 2, we had stop motion animation for crying out loud. So it was really exciting to be able to work with a guy that imaginative and knowing that everything was gonna be on the table. For us, it was a big project. And given that K&B had been around for just a few years, it was also a good opportunity for us as a calling card to, to get people to notice our company. So that does it for the making of Army of Darkness. And unfortunately, it can just never be smooth sailing when it comes to getting these distributed. Most Evil Dead fans are probably aware there was an alternate original ending to Army of Darkness. As we know it, it flashes forward to the supermarket and Ash gets the girl. That was actually reshot on Christmas Eve because test audiences found the original ending to be too dark. The original ending had Ash going too far forward in time, so he wakes up with a massive beard on his face and he's in basically a post-apocalyptic London and it fades to black. I kind of liked that, but I am happy, honestly, that the original trilogy does have a happy ending to it. Then they had trouble with the ratings board again, pretty much just because they had beef with them because of the first two Evil Dead movies. They slapped the movie with an X rating and when they asked them what they needed to cut out, they just gave them some bullshit like, oh, it's just the cumulative effect. So they sent it back through without doing any cuts to the film because they figured that they probably didn't even watch the movie. And I think they were right because when they got the movie back, they got their R rating, which I think is absurd because it's about as graphic and fantastical as something like Pirates of the Caribbean and that movie is PG-13. So I'll leave this part of the chapter in the wise, wise words of Bruce Campbell. The ratings board has its head so far up its ass, it's ridiculous. It's terrifying, kids. You're gonna love this picture. It's got thrills, chills, action, adventure. Why I oughta... As I mentioned earlier, Universal had them change the movie from The Medieval Dead to Army of Darkness, and so all around, they really just didn't know how to market this movie. Bruce Campbell has a theory that the audience didn't really understand that this movie was connected to the previous two films. So this one did not do too well in the box office. The original budget of this movie was actually about $11 million, but yet again, things just kept costing more money. So producers like Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell kept taking pay cuts so they could fund the film. But just bear in mind that initial budget, because domestically, they only really broke even. They made about $11.5 million domestically. But luckily, they did have a worldwide gross of about $21.5 million. At the time in 1993, Roger Ebert, if you somehow don't know, he is one of the most famous movie critics, at least in this country. He gave the movie two stars and he opened the review by saying, Sam Raimi's Army of Darkness is a goofy, hyperventilated send-up of horror films and medieval warfare. So action-packed, it sometimes seems less like a movie than like a cardiovascular workout for its stars. I mean, I guess he's not wrong. He does praise the makeup and effects though, and he also goes on to say, the movie seems aimed at an audience of 14 year olds who would have been eight when Evil Dead 2 came out. So maybe this will all seem breathtakingly original. Well then maybe I'm 14 at heart then, I don't know. Very sassy, kind of rude. I don't put it past him because I have also been sassy and rude in my reviews. Because I love this movie to death, I'm gonna say, you wanna, you want some of these? You want some of these? Ebert is rolling in his grave right now, I know it. The critical response was very mixed and lukewarm at best, but everyone praised the practical effects. However, at the Fangoria Chainsaw Awards, they won really big that year, and Bruce Campbell did not mind showing off on stage the lack of care that he has for his spine. The winner is Bruce Campbell for Army of Darkness! Well, I feel all warm and fuzzy, I'll tell you. <laughs> Needless to say, I'm, uh, I'm very grateful for all of you fine and wacky and unique fans. Army of Darkness has found its audience, and by now most members of the fandom adore this film. It does fall at the bottom of a lot of people's ranking lists, but many fans will qualify that it's just because one of the movies has to be at the bottom, but they still love it. And that's just the way it is. This movie luckily receives a lot of love these days. But that wraps up my coverage on the original Evil Dead trilogy. Time to move on.
There are a lot of video games in this franchise, and being that I'm not a gamer, this is not gonna be my main focus, as I said. I'll give you a brief overview of each game with some B-roll of the gameplay and just give you some fun facts. And we will break up the video game era into two parts because in the middle of it, Evil Dead 2013 and Ash vs. Evil Dead were released. Also heads up, I will be including spoilers to a bunch of these games because canonically a couple of them are connected. So starting with Hail to the King, released in 2000, it's playable on PC, Dreamcast, and PlayStation. The game takes place eight years after the events of Army of Darkness. After regaining his job at S-Mart and beginning a new relationship with fellow employee Jenny, Ash Williams begins suffering from recurring nightmares about the Necronomicon and the Deadites, which haunt him for years. Wanting to help him, Jenny decides to take Ash back to Professor Nobi's old cabin to help him face his demons. Towards the end, Ash saves Jenny from possession and then they go through a portal back home. But upon arriving back home, Ash and Jenny discover to their horror that they've arrived at a version of Dearborn, Michigan that is ruled by the Dark Ones. Seeing several various Necronomicon books in a shop window, no, Ash screams as the game ends. Bruce Campbell also lent his voice for this video game, as he did with many others, including the next game, Evil Dead, A Fistful of Boomstick from 2003. It was released for PlayStation and Xbox. It takes place 11 years after the events of Army of Darkness and three years after the events of Hail to the King. The game begins with Ash Williams telling the story of his battles with the Necronomicon Ex Mortis to a man. Then he starts to tell the story of how he ended up here with the man in the first place through a series of flashbacks. These flashbacks culminate in him confronting a dead eyed queen and blowing her up using dynamite. Then in the epilogue, Ash accidentally sends himself to feudal Japan, and it turns out that's where he's been recalling his flashbacks the whole time. This game received mixed reviews, but many critics noted that it was an improvement over the previous installment. Also in 2003, there was an Evil Dead pinball for mobile game. No story because it's obviously just pinball, but thought that was interesting. That's obviously not connected to anything, and the same can be said for the next game, which is Evil Dead Regeneration, released in 2005. This was released for Microsoft Windows, Xbox, and PlayStation. Station. The game takes place in an alternate reality from the original trilogy where the film Army of Darkness never took place, depicting what would have happened if Ash did not get sent back in time at the end of the film Evil Dead 2. Ash Williams is locked away in an asylum for the criminally insane as a result of the events that took place in Evil Dead and Evil Dead 2. Convinced the world thinks he's crazy, the truth is much more nefarious. His doctor, Dr. Reinhard, somehow in possession of Professor Raymond Noby's diary and the Necronomicon Ex Mortis, plans on using the books to bring about his ascension to power. In the process, he releases an army of deadites on the unsuspecting world, and it is Ash's job to stop the Doctor and put the deadites back where they belong. And these games just can never have happy endings, because again, Ash is about to kiss the girl when he gets sucked back into another portal, presumably to an alternate version of Army of Darkness. Yet again, this game received mixed reviews, usually being scored between 6 and 7 on a scale of 10. Now in 2011, they switched things up again and released two different games made to play on your phone. Army of Darkness Defense can be played on iOS and Android, and of course, is based on Army of Darkness. Yet again, Bruce Campbell narrates, and it opens much like the film. It wasn't always like this. I had a real life once. A job. Um, hardware, aisle 12. Shop smart, shop S smart. This game also follows Ash Williams. The player fights off waves of the enemy using an army to protect the Necronomicon. The game also has appearances by Lord Arthur, Sheila, Duke Henry the Red, and Evil Ash. To my knowledge, there were 50 levels of the game, and yet again, it received mixed to average reviews. Now, like I said, there was another game released for iOS in 2011 called Evil Dead the Game, but because it has such a generic name, I'm not 100% certain that the gameplay that I found is from that game. Because the only reporting I found on it was this Dread Central article from 2011, and as you can see, all the pictures of the game have been removed, though I did find a video titled Evil Dead iPhone Gameplay, so I think this is it. Where the Army of Darkness game is a standard walk and shoot, this game follows Ash around the cabin where nastiness awaits. Instead of just moving forward and back, players can move in 360 degrees of blood-soaked fun. Through 30 levels, the game gets progressively harder the further one gets. Obstacles include your demon-possessed friends, stinging bushes, the, you know, trees, big worms that seem to appear out of nowhere and a water hazard. This YouTuber Pocket Gamer had a lot of pros and cons for the game, but concluded by saying the game is ultimately more frustrating than fun to play. That will do for the first round of the video game era, so now it's time to get back into the films. Listen, you gotta get out of those clothes. You have to get me out of here. 
This is a very fresh era of the franchise, and I'll reiterate that I did already cover this film in depth. In my original vs. Remake video, I focused more so on the torture that Jane Levy endured and the style of this film. So I talked a lot about the camera work, the writing, the effects. Luckily, this time around, I have also now listened to the director and actor's commentary on the film. So hopefully I can offer a little bit more insight. Now, talks for a fourth Evil Dead film had started back in 2004, but this movie wasn't announced until 2011 with Fede Alvarez slated to direct. This was also his feature debut you, by the way. It was written by Roto Sayages, and then it was doctored by Diablo Cody. Something important to note is that it is not a remake, even though I have covered it as such on my channel before. Well, since Sam Raimi's been promoting Oz the Great and Powerful, he said he's already starting to write a script for a fourth in your line of Evil Dead films. What would that mean to have uh, both series going on at the same time? I mean, that's what you want. Uh, they, they can operate in the same parallel world, which we, there's nothing to worry about. Nothing is usurping anything. It's an expanding Evil Dead world. I mean, I would consider it a reboot, just considering that the last movie of the franchise came out 20 years prior. And that's very much a trilogy. Like, it's very much its own thing compared to this. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to Evil Dead Rise, though, and how everything connects. Much like Evil Dead Rise, they shot this movie in New Zealand in 2012. We filmed on a, a Maori burial ground. That's right. Um, we had to actually get blessed on the first day of yeah. filming. That's like New Zealand tradition. Poltergeist vibes, for sure. A very interesting almost for this movie is that Lily Collins was originally cast in the role of Mia, which I just honestly couldn't see her in this film. But most of the interest about this film for me lies in the making, because it is one of the goriest films ever made, which I did cover in my previous video. There was almost no CGI done in this film. It was done practically with about 70,000 gallons of fake blood. 50,000 gallons in the blood rain scene alone. Since I've already covered a lot of the making of insights, I'm just gonna blow through a bunch of the fun facts as they appear in the movie. Starting with the deformed extra in the opening scene, did you know that he has survived two plane crashes. Another extra in that scene was the OG producer Robert Tappard's son. Or did you know that one of the most predominant sounds in the score is of a siren? I can't play the score because of copyright reasons, but fun little story about that. Fede specifically told each department head to find some sort of signature stamp to put on this film in their work. The composer was from Spain and he had just moved to LA and he was horrified by the constant sirens that he was always hearing outside of his apartment. So that is how they ended up as one of the signature sounds of the score. One of the first homage to the original that comes up in the film is the fact that Eric is always playing with a deck of cards. This was partially because of the Ace of Spades reference to the original. To spades! <laughs> But it was also because Fede and Lou realized that they were both magicians. And by now we all know how grueling this movie was for Jane Levy, I got into that already. But for instance, she didn't know how to fake choke, so she was really basically just choking herself in this scene. And not only was the physicality of what she was doing on screen very difficult, but Fede would also make her jump rope, do sprints, do jumping jacks to get her pumped up for every emotional scene as well. Again, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to point you to my other video because she faced horrors on that set. But moving on, they also also cut out a scene from the script where the characters pull out their phones and realize they have no cell service. There's actually no phones or much technology in the movie at all. A very timeless choice in my opinion, I prefer that. Back to practical effects, one of the worst scenes in this movie was painfully real for everyone involved. This was the hardest thing ever. <laughs> but pretty amazing that we did it. Yep. That That's actually so came out of my mouth. We did that probably four times. I wish she elaborated on that, like how did they do that? I'm sure there was some sort of like tubing system in her mouth so they could make the vomit project out of it, but I don't know, they don't tell us. Vomit is way worse than other gore to me. Disgusting. Oh, also remember how Lou was a magician? He used his sleight of hand here to make it look like he was pulling the needle out of his face, all practical. Throughout a lot of shooting, Fede also kept actor Shiloh Fernandez in the dark because he wanted a lot of his reactions to feel real. Let's skip ahead to the end though, because I know that that's what everyone wants to talk about. Three big things about that scene. The demon that came out of the ground was a 60 year old man wearing her face in a little thong. And when her knee is stabbed, that was one of Natalie's prosthetic elbows. Remember the girl that cut off her arm? Yeah, thank God they had some extras lying around. And finally, I'll let Jane Levy take it from here. This, oh, we did this so shot cool. for maybe a minute straight. There was blood coming from yeah. everywhere. And after we cut, the whole crew cheered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yay! Thus concludes our Evil Dead fun fact chapter. Review it. Review it. Do it. 
review it. Now, much like a lot of the video games that came before it, this movie was met with very lukewarm reviews from critics. Fans, it's a whole other ball game, but we'll get into that in a second. It earned a 63% critically on Rotten Tomatoes with a 64% audience score. It may lack the absurd humor that underlined the original, but the new look Evil Dead compensates with brutal terror, gory scares, and gleefully bloody violence. On IMDb, the ratings are kind of all over the board, but average out to six and a half. I also thought that it might be fun to look at reviews of this movie that came out on YouTube at the time, because this came out 10 years ago, so it's basically archival footage at this point. I chose three different reviews to look at from well-known channels. We have Jeremy Johns and Chris Stuckman and The Flick Pick, all of whom still make content. Chris Stuckman and The Flick Pick actually really reviewed the film, but all three of them did praise the practical effects. Chris Stuckman gave the movie a B and Flick Pick gave it a B plus, so I guess that letter ratings were really in fashion back then. Jeremy Johns was quite a character. I've never watched his content before, but in the opening 10 seconds of his review, he is referring to women as bitches. You know, I'm of the belief that every movie has a lesson. The lesson in Evil Dead is simple. Demonically possessed bitches and nail guns, they do not mix. I mean, they mix for her, but not for anyone else in the room. Anyone else in the room, it's a bad day. 2013 was just a, a different time on the internet. And he kind of just recaps a lot of what happens in the movie, but he does conclude by saying that horror and gore fans would be pleased. So despite critically never doing that well, it has always been pretty well liked by the common people. To some people in the fandom though, it is the best piece of Evil Dead content that has ever existed, and I understand them too. From a $17 million budget, it went on to make over $97 million in the box office. It also won several awards, like Best Makeup and Best Effects at the Fright Meter Awards. It won Best Original Score and Best Film Music Composition at the International Film Music Critic Awards, and it won Best Makeup and Creature Effects at the 2013 Fangoria Chainsaw Awards. Overall, a success, I would say, and with that, it's time to move on. I'm only gonna touch on Ash vs. Evil Dead briefly, so this may be the shortest chapter of the video. This is purely because one, I haven't seen the show yet, but don't worry, it's on my list. And two, because with so much ground to cover, so much content there, I do kind of wanna cover one season per video as sort of like an extension to this deep dive. So if that sounds good to you and you're not subscribed yet, then stick around, click that button, baby, and turn on the notification bell so you don't miss it. All that to say, I'm gonna save all of the interview snippets for now and just focus on the basic info of the show. Originally, there were two competing ideas for a fourth Evil Dead film. Since Fede Alvarez's Evil Dead was complete now, they used their other idea for this project. However, they were concerned about not being able to get funding for it, so they wrote it as a TV show, with Bruce Campbell reprising his role as Ash. Ash has spent the last 30 years avoiding responsibility, maturity, and the terrors of the Evil Dead until a deadite plague threatens to destroy all of mankind and Ash becomes mankind's only hope. It ran for three 10 episode seasons on Stars, starting in Halloween of 2015 and ran until its cancellation in April of 2018. The fans rallied after this though, and they tried to get Netflix to pick up the show and continue it. But Bruce Campbell responded to those efforts by saying, big props to fans for the effort, but I'm retired as Ash. Hashtag time to fry some other fish. More on that later because it might not necessarily be true, but this was a genuinely appreciated opportunity for Bruce Campbell. Uh, I did Ash vs. Evil Dead, the TV show, so I I could go back like George Lucas and fix some shit with that character. Cause I had about 25 years of experience from the from Army of Darkness. But it was an opportunity to go back as an adult actor because the irony in my life is I'm best known for the thing that I was least qualified for. Cause we didn't know shit from Shinola. I wanted to actually go back and apply myself as a a semi-trained actor now to go back to that one and a half dimensional doofus and flesh him out. We did that for 30 episodes, so uh, that felt good. So if he really is retiring, I'm glad that he felt that it was fulfilling to go back and do right by Ash this one last time. In contrast to many of its predecessors, it has an average rating of 8.4 on IMDb. 94% of Google users like this show. It has a 4.9 out of 5 on Facebook, which I didn't know that rating stuff on Facebook was even a thing. And since I've started covering this franchise on my channel, my subscribers have been adamant that I need to watch the show. Don't worry, it is very high up on my list. I also know that Samara Weaving has a recurring role and that's obviously very interesting to me. Plus I wanna get more Evil Dead content out for you. I'm on a roll now, I'm in too deep. But like I said, short chapter, that does it for all my coverage on Ash vs Evil Dead for now. Much more to come in the future. Oh, 
All right, video game era part two, only three more to cover, starting with Evil Dead Endless Nightmare. This game came out in 2016 and is playable on iOS and Android. Players control a nameless character, though it's implied to be Ash Williams, as they run through the woods collecting power-ups, weapons, and blood drops. Since there is no proper ending to the game, the primary objective is to get the longest distance possible without dying. Mia Allen is the only character from any of the Evil Dead films to appear in this game, and there's recycled audio of Jane Levy in the 2013 film that's used to make up her dialogue. Three weapons from the original Evil Dead trilogy also appear in the game, which includes the modified chainsaw, the boomstick, and the Kandarian dagger. And the next video game is an extension of this one, Evil Dead Virtual Nightmare. Endless Nightmare was eventually re-released for virtual reality headsets as Evil Dead Virtual Nightmare, which was then released for mobile devices as Evil Dead Extended Nightmare. To my understanding, this is essentially the same game as Endless Nightmare, obviously just much more immersive. It was hard to find this gameplay online, though. There isn't much of it out there. I'm unsure of all the nuances here, but to my basic understanding, they're all pretty much the same game, just released to different mediums. Now, the last game we have to talk about is probably the most exciting one for everybody. Evil Dead The Game, released in 2022, just last year. It turns out that Bruce Campbell hadn't quite retired the character because he does voice Ash in this game. Dana DeLorenz and Ray Santiago also reprise their role from Ash vs. Evil Dead for the game. And it looks like most of the original cast actually reprises their roles for this game. It was released for PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, Windows, Xbox One, and Xbox Series XS. And apparently it'll be released for Nintendo Switch at a later date. And it was just recently made available for free to PlayStation Plus on February 7th, 2023. This game marks the first time in the Evil Dead franchise history that all four studios that own their respective films in the series have partnered to create a single product, with the addition of stars allowing elements from the Ash vs. Evil Dead television series as well. You can step into the shoes of Ash Williams or his friends from the iconic Evil Dead franchise and work together in a game loaded with over-the-top co-op and PvP multiplayer action. Play as a team of four survivors, exploring, looting, managing your fear, and finding key items to seal the breach between worlds. You can play as good or evil, fight for the forces of good, or take control of the Kandarian demon to hunt Ash and others while possessing deadites, the environmental objects, and more as you seek to swallow their souls. There's a battle royale mode too, apparently. Like, there's just a lot going on in this game. It sounds like a hoot. It's also been met with acclaim. It's received ratings mostly in the 80s across the board, making it the highest rated Evil Dead video game to date, and released just in time for the next big thing in the franchise. <laughs> title card gives me goosebumps every single time. Slight disclaimer as well, I already gave that movie a solo review, which might not sound like much if you're new here, but when I give a movie a solo review, I go in deep. I share as many interview insights and info as I can. So I've already covered this movie pretty extensively. Luckily, there have been a few new developments concerning behind the scenes stuff that has been posted to Twitter of all places. And excitingly, this movie just passed $100 million at the box office, so happy news all around. So again, I will be giving you the Spark Notes version here. I hope that's okay. Like I said, whole Evil Dead playlist at the ready on my channel for you to watch. This movie was announced in 2019, written in 2020, and production went underway in 2021. Again, they shot in New Zealand, but this time they used Australian actors Lily Sullivan and Alyssa Sutherland. Something new I learned recently is where they got their inspiration for their roles. Lily was inspired by Tony Collette in Hereditary, another Aussie legend, and you will never guess what inspired our dear maggot mommy. I watched a lot of like reference movies before, and there was something in my gut telling me I have to watch The Mask. I have to watch The Mask. There was something about like the enhancement that happened when Jim Carrey put on this ancient mask and I was like, okay, how old is this book? Like how long has this evil force been tied to this book without having a human to embody? And I loved like the joy of The Mask. And I was like, I'm going to bring that. There has to be rage in the Deadite to be scary, but also the joy and the celebration of carnage. I guess that makes sense, yeah. Her Deadite character positively delighted in the chaos of the carnage, which is perfect. That's the sole purpose of a Deadite's existence, to create and delight in the chaos. But moving on now, since I basically already covered all of the interview insights, let's take a look at all the stuff that I've bookmarked on Twitter. Starting with this lovely side-by-side -side from Melissa Sutherland, where she's like, guess which one I had more fun doing? I love this picture of her. It definitely has 
screensaver potential. Lily then replied to her with the same thing. There she is covered in blood. Not so fun fact, she said that she had to walk around set with a spray bottle full of water so that her eyes wouldn't get glued shut. Up next, we get a little goof moment from Alyssa in the tub. I wonder if she said that in between takes of mommies with the maggots now. Then here we get another stunt test of her getting pulled back with a harness on. Lee Cronin also posted some stunt tests and it was for the blood slip and slide out of the elevator. He said, so when you're gonna use up thousands of gallons of blood on one shot, it's important to test it will work with water first. We get to see it from like every angle. It's so crazy. They had a child to do this, but she has a helmet on, she's fine. He also posted a video of the opening sequence star just hanging out at the lake. I love that this was done practically in true Evil Dead fashion. She's suspended above a real lake on wires. It's nuts. He also posted some storyboards and I find it fascinating how the maggot mommy was first conceptualized. She looks very different. Like they originally envisioned her looking much older or something. We have a behind the scenes photo of the opening actresses right after she gets scalped. Very cute. I also raved about the sound design in my review. And so Lee Cronin actually posted a shot of the script and it shows how the sound design was preconceived from the beginning. My personal favorite line is a judder of possessed energy courses through Ellie. The horrible sound of grinding bone as her broken body realigns. Sound design was no joke. Love it. The last thing I want to share is when the stunt doubles were practicing the cheese grater scene for the first time. You can definitely see in the video the skeleton of what the scene would become. I love when people are proud of their work and they share it for everyone else to enjoy. I just think that's really cool. And like I said, as of May 5th, this movie crossed the $100 million mark at the box office. It's really never been a better time to be an Evil Dead fan, especially considering that Bruce Campbell has teased the very near future of this franchise. It's all about the books now, Campbell tells the outlet, and has nothing to do with Ash or any particular character. In Army of Darkness, we first saw three books, so we know that they're out there and none of them are any good. It's about where does that darn book wind up, who gets it, and what happens. Talking specifically about what comes next, Campbell previews, I think the stories will progress a little more now. We're going to try to do them more like every two or three years rather than every 10 years. It's also the first time Sam is working with his brother Ivan to create an overall Bible that will give future writers and directors an idea of where this thing should go next to potentially tie in some of these stories. So I think it's going to get a little more tied in as the years go by. Basically an Evil Dead MCU, I guess? Sounds good to me. So like I said, Evil Dead 2013 is not really a remake and Evil Dead Rise is also not a reboot because both are technically just expansions of the franchise. Campbell points out that the three books from Army of Darkness could have ended up anywhere. And it's so exciting that it could all connect at some point. In my Evil Dead Rise review, I did feature an interview clip where Bruce Campbell was talking about how his and Mia's and Beth's stories could all align one day. But I don't want to get anyone too excited because he still could hold fast to his character being retired. Hi, I'm editing. I had to pop in because maybe I should be letting you guys get excited. Because look at this tweet from Bruce Campbell from just a few days ago. He's like, mm, I kind of miss the character too. <laughs> Okay, that's all I wanted to share. Bye. What we can tangibly be excited about is the Bible that Sam Raimi is creating to guide the franchise, as well as Lee Cronin's possible plans for new films. In a Variety interview, he shared four possible things that he wants to see in future installments. The story behind the Book of the Dead, we have history in this film and that's presented through the vinyl. So there's a story to be told there. It's not by accident. Two, Beth takes her chainsaw on the road. Somebody that survives picks up the chainsaw at the end and where they might go. Three, the apartment building. There's also the aftermath and the this building and who encounters that. And I've often thought, what happens when the cleanup crew shows up? And finally, back to the woods. Because of this opening and the closing, there's that continuation of how this evil has a gate. That brings us back into that forest context, which excites me because I love that I broke the mold, but wouldn't it be fun now if I went back to the cabin in the woods? It could be a cool journey. I think that I am most curious about the story behind the inception of the Book of the Dead because I love period piece horror. I think there is so much to explore there. I think that I would probably be least excited about going back to the cabin. Just because that's a very well-trod territory, I didn't even like seeing it in Evil Dead Rise. That is one of my main gripes about the new film. But the other ideas I really like too. Because I think that there is a lot of room for entertainment value concerning who comes to clean up the apartment building, though I don't really want to have another movie in the same location. But having Beth become like the next John Wick in a world filling with deadites, I would pay to see that. So far, that is all that we know right now about the future of this franchise. And so that concludes this chapter of the video. I think the Evil Dead have survived for so long because it's about the filmmaker's love of entertaining the audience, whether it's comedy or adventure or horror to the extreme. It's always about the fans' participation also. I just want to wrap up this video talking about all the other tidbits that I found that didn't necessarily deserve their own chapter. For example, did you know that there was an Evil Dead musical? You can actually watch the whole thing in its entirety on
on YouTube. I found an off-Broadway performance on here for free. Turns out there are tons of original songs on it for all you musical junkies out there, including a charming little number called What the F*** Was That? <laughs> Apparently they also had a splash zone, and so if you were sitting in the first few rows, you were basically guaranteed to be covered in fake blood by the end. The play started in 2003, and as far as I know, ran until 2017. I found a pretty high quality clip from a 2017 performance where they recreated the hand flip scene. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite nailing the flip, but I respect the hustle. Another few things that I have yet to touch on are all of the comic books. My god, so many comic books. And all of the action figures. I didn't even begin to dive into that, just trust me, there's a lot of them. My specialty lies in analyzing film, and so if anyone wants to chime in with any fun facts about that, feel free. The last thing that I want to touch on is just the lasting legacy, the conventions, and you guys. Bruce Campbell and Sam Raimi, of course, have been doing all the conventions from the get-go, but for a long time, the ladies of the original Evil Dead had no idea the impact of this franchise. They only really started getting into it and going to conventions about 20 years ago. My favorite moments have been the tattoos that people have come and show me because my face in the cellar happens to be tattooed on about six different people's arms. So those are, those are some fun moments for me. One of my most favorite fan moments was a couple of years back we were in Baltimore and we had a chance to meet Alice Cooper, mm -hmm. who we had heard was a big fan of Evil Dead. He didn't realize what big fans we were of Alice Cooper's. I'm eight. <laughs> we love Alice Cooper. We love Alice. We love him even more now. It's so fun. They talk about how in their real lives, they're just regular moms who go to PTA meetings and stuff like that. But they get to live this crazy second life where total strangers get their faces tattooed on their bodies. Not even to mention all the other artists that this franchise has inspired. I already played you the snippets from Del Toro and Tarantino, but Edgar Wright and Peter Jackson are just a few other huge names that have listed these movies as a huge inspiration, the ripple effects of this franchise really know no bounds, and it's never been more relevant. It's amazing how the success of a franchise starts so small and then just compounds and compounds and compounds. This is one of the most fascinating horror franchises to me. I had so much fun just falling down rabbit hole after rabbit hole. I hope I did the fans proud. I am new to all of this, but now I would definitely consider myself an expert in the making of. The next step is to rewatch all the movies over and over so I can become an expert on all the references as well. Then I can really feel like a, like a true fan. Like I said in the future, I hope to cover each season of Ash vs. Evil Dead, so let me know if that interests you. But that brings us to the end of this deep dive. Big ups to you if you made it this far. You also probably noticed some names scrolling on screen here. These are my patrons, and they are the reason why this extra long and juicy video came to you today. Without them, I would not be able to make this high quality content for you because one of the key ingredients in doing that is time. It takes so much time to make these videos, so they supplement my income on the days when I am researching or writing. So we love you patrons, Mwah. As a thank you to them, I do post four to six bonus videos over on Patreon every single month. When I'm not gonna do a deep dive on a new horror movie, I give it a solo review over on my Patreon. I also do sesh story times and fun little things like that. But if that's not for you, all the rest of my info is down below, my affiliate links, my social media, go nuts, have fun. Please don't be shy. If you just found me because of this video, then say hi in the comments. Let me know your favorite thing that you learned today or your favorite fun fact in general, whatever you want. More than anything, I just hope that you enjoyed this video and that I catch you in the next one. Stay groovy.